Now remember, an agent needs a self-model if it's part of the world that it's trying to modify. So on that basis, the thinker and the doer definitely need self-models. And the thinker self-model is the very complicated I, me, my concept I've talked about. It also has a simplified body model that it thinks it controls completely. I am in complete control of this body. That's what my thinker is saying. And it's not true, but he thinks that. It also has goals that the thinker made up, such as I must always be right. And if any of you tell me that I'm wrong, I'll let you know why. <laughs> so the doer self-model is much simpler. It's essentially the full body model. It's the model of the entire body of what it's capable of, and it knows how to operate that body to, do, to achieve whatever goal it wants to achieve. And the doer's goals are indicated by emotions and feelings. Now, at first glance, the experiencer looks like it doesn't need to have a self-model because the experiencer doesn't change the external world. All it's doing is taking information in. It's not doing anything out to the external world. However, the experiencer does pay attention, both top-down and bottom-up attention. And attention changes the internal representation of the world. When you're paying attention to a certain area, you're essentially amplifying that signal for that area so that the, th the thinker and the doer can do something with that area, whatever you're doing. If you're reading a book, you're paying attention to the words of the page so that you can understand what they mean. So directing attention does change the internal world, representation of the world. So in that internal world, there has to be representation of, this, of the experiencer. Since paying attention modifies the internal world, the attention state of the, that the experiencer has right now has to be combined with the world model that the experiencer has, has constructed. The two of those together give you the actual model of the world. And you, you could say, in a sense, the experiencer is this current state of attention combined with the current state of the world model. You couldn't do any one of those separately. It has to be those two combined is what gives you the, what the experiencer is. So this leads to the first experience of self-model, which is that the self-model is identical to the world model. Because the world model is not just the state of the world, but it's also where you're paying attention, so you can interpret that model correctly. Now, if the experiencer doesn't have a separate world self-model, you could say that the experiencer has no self-model because it's no different than the world model. This experiential self-model is directly related to a neuroscience theory called attention schema theory by the neuroscientist Michael Graziano. And uh, the attention schema is, is exactly the same as the model of the current attention state. That's what the attention schema is. And Graz Graziano proposes that the consciousness evolved when brains started to direct attention. So before the brain started to direct attention to one object or another, he would claim all the animals that existed in that state were not conscious. But animals that can direct attention to one place or another, those are conscious animals, according to his theory. And the, um, the example is the hydra. A hydra is a primitive animal that, that lives in the water. It's a small animal. And if you touch it anywhere on its body, it does the same reaction. It kind of contracts itself into a ball shape to, to, to get away from it. Now, if it, if it moved away from wherever you touched it, then it would be directing attention. It would know that you touched it on this spot here, so move the body away from there. But it does, just has a generalized response of contracting the entire body. So the claim is that the hydra does not direct attention to any particular sensory input. It treats all the sensory inputs as equal. So the hydra would not have consciousness. But as soon as we had a, the first primitive animal in the world that did direct attention, I claim that that first animal that, that directed attention was the first animal in the world to, to create an abstract concept. Now, animals create concepts all the time. So they can recognize objects. They can recognize prey versus predator. Those are concepts that animals have built into them, or they learn it in their own experience. And so animals have conceptual models of the world, but it's all these conceptual models are directly related to the world out there, to the sensory perceptions that's received. This, this concept of the attention schema is the first one that's totally internal. It's totally related to the model of the world. It doesn't have anything to do with the world out there. So I claim that this attention schema is the first abstract concept created by an animal when that first primitive animal did it. And as soon as they started doing this, they became conscious. And in fact, if you think about that first abstract concept, you could say that that is the I concept. Because I am the one directing the experiencer's attention. So the attention schema is an abstract concept that really corresponds to who I am, because I'm directing that attention. Now, the human as a whole is an agent, so there's one more self-model that we have to consider, which is the entire human self-model. And how does that self-model change with both time and with spiritual practices? 
So this is kind of a preview of the whole rest of this talk here. So uh, this, this slide will, will give you a lot. Well, that's one thing I forgot to mention in those, the diagram of the experiencer. The experiencer has the, model, the conceptual model of the world, the sensory model of the world, and all of the self-models. It has the self-model of the thinker, the self-model of the doer, and the self-model of the experiencer, and the self-model of the human as a whole. They're all contained in that experiencer model of the world and body and self. I believe that the ancient human self-model would be equal to the doer self-model, which is what an essentially animals have. Their self-model is their own body. A normal, modern, non-spiritual human would have the human self-model equal to the thinker self-model. The typical non-spiritual modern human completely identifies as the thinker self-model. So that human self-model that I have, that's equal to the thinker self-model. And the reason this happens is that the thinker's inner voice is continually bombarding the experiencer with statements equivalent to, I am, I mean my, and I am in complete control of the body. It's telling the experiencer that's who I am. And the experiencer eventually believes that and updates the human's overall self-model to equal the thinker self-model. I am my thinker. That's who I think I am. I think I, I am that little voice in my head. That's who I am. A spiritual modern human would say that the human self-model is less than the thinker self-model. In a sense, they become aware of the doer and the experiencer, which are, which are the bigger part of us. You know, the, the doer and experiencer do most of the work of living in the world. The thinker takes all the credit, though. The thinker since, thinks he did it all. So the spiritual modern human realizes that I am not just my thinker. I am something else, too. And a spiritually enlightened modern human would actually have their human self-model equal to the experiencer self-model. And I'll explain the, this enlightened state of consciousness on the, on the next slide. I'll call this kind of uh, human self-model as the experiencer consciousness. First of all, enlightenment is, is not about any kind of perfection. Uh, Daniel Ingram wrote the book Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, and one of his chapters there, he went through 31 different models of enlightenment. Many of them have perfection of one kind or another in them. And he basically rejects all those models except for the non-duality model. And enlightenment is therefore about a different kind of perception of the world and requires a fundamental change in the self-model of the human. In order to be non-dual, you have to give up the idea that you're your autobiographical self-model and that you're your body. That's what a non-dual enlightened being would believe. And there are multiple kinds of enlightenment. For example, Bernadette Roberts reported having two. And Ingram, Daniel Ingram documents between two and 11 different stages of enlightenment in different uh, Buddhist traditions. There are many different Buddhist sects, and each sect has a certain number of stages of enlightenment. Now, the Hindu Advaita Vedanta tradition says that enlightenment is non-dual. This means not two, one, which means that the self and other distinction is an illusion. There isn't really a difference between self and other. In other words, the world and I are one. Now, the first experience of self-model is that the self-model equals the entire whole world model. And therefore, experience or consciousness is non-dual. If you can get into that experience or consciousness state where you think that you're the experiencer self-model, you would have a non-dual experience. Further, in Buddhism, they talk about anatta, which is the realization that self of any kind is an illusion. There is no self. The second experience of self-model is that there is no self-model. Therefore, anatta is also realized in experience or consciousness. Now, in my, some of my other talks that are on Utah, YouTube, I talk a lot more about uh, enlightenment. This is all I'm going to talk about here because I only have 45 minutes. So let's talk about agents' goals now. And there are goals that are set by evolution. In fact, for the doer, the goals are to stay alive, avoiding danger and predators, obtain food, water, and shelter, and to reproduce, raise children, and to be social. And humans are intensely social animals, so this is a very strong goal in humans, this pro-social goal. Now, the experiencer goals are much simpler. Well, not simpler. They're, they're just to create a sensory model of the world. This is a very big a, a part of our brain. To direct top, down, and bottom up attention, and to pay attention to the thinker's inner voice and to the doer's emotions. The thinker's goals is simply to solve problems. Evolution has basically designed the thinker to be a generalized problem solver, because it's not, it doesn't know what kind of problems are going to be encountered in, in the world at any given time. So the idea of, gen of having a thinker module was to handle whatever problems come up. And it's a good thing, because this thinker has been able to handle the conceptual world that we live in right now, which is way, way different than anything that evolution could have imagined. 
You know, those billions and billions of concepts that we live in is way different than anything that, uh, that other animals experience. So that's the only goal set by evolution for the thinker is to solve problems. Now each agent can create new goals to help meet current goals, and that's one of the most intelligent things an agent can do. For example, to meet my goal of getting a PhD in physics, there were a lot of sub-goals I had to build out there to figure out how to get to that final goal. The thinker and doer can learn goals from each other, so the, the thinker can learn to be pro-social from the doer. The doer goals are indicated by emotions and feelings, and most of the doer goals are short-term. The thinker's goals are more long-term and use past experiences to plan for the future. And the thinker can also make up purely conceptual goals, such as, I want to get a PhD in physics, or I must always be right. Let's look at some spiritual virtues and values. And if you look at all the spiritual virtues there, they all will help social interactions go more smoothly. So if we're a social animal, using spiritual virtues is a good thing. The spiritual vices all tend to be self-centered and antisocial. So those are, those are going to work against our pro-social goals that we have. So the pro-social goals of the doer are strong, and that makes the doer more likely to practice spiritual virtues. But the doer's self-model is the body. So if the body is threatened, the doer will do whatever is necessary to protect it. And that could include engaging in spiritual vices, stealing, or whatever else it's going to do to protect that body. Now, the thinker can copy the doer's pro-social goals, so the thinker can also have spiritual virtues, can practice spiritual virtues. But the thinker is more likely to be self-centered. In fact, the I, me, my concept is basically the definition of self-centeredness. Further, the I, me, my is easily threatened by just words. For example, somebody telling me that I'm wrong. That's threatening to me. I've got to defend myself against that and argue with them, get angry at them, whatever. So the thinker is more likely to, involve, uh, in get, to get involved in spiritual vices by trying to protect its I, me, my. So the doer's pro-social pro goals are the basic source of spiritual virtues in the world.